one called a seven lane. And he wrote a book of seven lanes, which I totally loved. And so this is kind of a takeoff from a, and a seven lane is three lines of one, three lines of one thing, three lines of another, and then a final line that takes you somewhere else or brings it together, whichever. Mm -hmm. So, in honor of Roger, the A, B, C of me, a seven link of sorts. Dear audience, A, three things about my body that you get to know. One, weight 135 pounds. Two, height five foot one, which used to be five foot two, but this is normal for my age, which we won't discuss. <laughs> Three, white hair, dyed, yes, but very flexible limbs due to morning yoga. B, one, three things about my spirit which you need to hear. One, teenage mentality when it comes to my sexual behavior, which is none of your damn business. <laughs> Two, ancient wisdom when it comes to my religion, which is way too private and too personal to discuss in public. Three, a demon known as deep depression that I keep forcibly locked in the back of my stuffiest closet and refuse to feed. C, conclusion as a water snake. Today, my name is Grandma, and I'm really good at diving deep with six strong legs wrapped tight around my waist. <laughs> so, and I wrote this after just staying with um, some of my grandkids in the Caribbean, and that's what I was doing for two weeks. <coughs> So this poem was written when my kids were breeding very madly. Now the kids are grown up. But this is called Little Fishy Scooped Out of the Ocean of Time. And I've never approved of fish poems, but here it is. They're the cutest little squirmy things, all slippery as fresh caught trout, and you so proud the way you carry them around. They smile and pout and wet and poo. It's true they hold the future in their bodies, and you so careful not to drop. While on the horizon, we grampies and grannies, great uncles and aunties, slowly descend in a pale orange glow, fumbling the triggers of our digital cameras. <laughs> no reason to fuss. It's the way of the world. But it's you, busy mummies and daddies, who never get to sleep. Thank you for working so hard to keep it all running. I'm so glad you learned how to cook. <laughs> So besides being a grandma, I am also a yoga teacher. And um, this poem, one of my few poems that actually won a first prize somewhere, so that's a good thing. It's called Yoga Class, The Teacher Speaks. So imagine you're in class. We sit straight, hold our hands open as cups, breathe deep, swelling breaths. My lips form familiar words, but I am not speaking. It is the mother who is speaking out through the channel of my throat. I am riding on the dark resonance of her voice that is not my voice, but hers. I listen as she speaks. She is telling us now to come touch each other. I feel other hands move warm into mine. I glance at the clock. We have one human hour. The room is darkening. The mother is saying to close our eyes. We do. And we see vast distances inside of ourselves. We see infinite darkness, and there we find color. We are watching our blood flow in rich, salty rivers. We are touching the ivory metal of bones. Our bodies are flowing in rhythm with the centuries. Slow is a tide moving over an island. We are mists bringing life to dark clay, making flesh, moving our flesh over ivory bones. I listen with heart expanding. I listen 
with mind carefully tuned. I speak, but the voice is not mine. All ears are turned inward. The mother is speaking of peace. Her voice that is sweet like the worlds that are breathing within us is speaking of peace, is speaking of peace. We are joined in the flow of the breath of her breathing. The mother is flowering. The mother is flowering. I listen, I hear words. I listen, I hear words and winds. I listen, I hear winds and waters. We are swimming in the dark honey of the song of our mother. We are holding together like the cells that make up a creature. We are breathing one breath like the breath of the planet, not sleeping nor waking, and still we are watching with visions that rise to a place some call heaven. We are joined in a blessing that is ours for the asking. We are vessels of peace. We are vessels of peace. So. <clears throat> yeah, so yoga, as you know, probably comes from India, and I am very attached to everything Indian. And the next two poems, which are quite long, both have a connection. One of these um, is called Like Magic. And I was hoping Anne and Eric Muller would be here. I don't see them. But I wrote this poem to thank them for a gift they gave me. As they were downsizing to a smaller, from their house to an apartment, they gave me these two beautiful paintings of um, Krishna, the oh. Indian god, and his gopis, and Radha. So the name of this poem is like magic for Anne and Eric. Because you brought me Krishna and his darling gopis, I broke into a cleaning frenzy meant to make my house a bit more worthy, and my vacuum cleaner chimed right in, throwing sparks like fireworks, clearly meant to honor him, but might have caught the house on fire if it weren't for my luckily adrenaline-related speed and shutting off. With dog and plastic wheelbarrow in tow, I headed for the Santa Clara Mall to buy another where I met a woman, 40-something, I suppose, but she could have passed for 80. She was clearly sick, bent over, frail and pasty gray, who praised the wheelbarrow and stroked the dog, explaining that she suffered from a rare disease, a form of hepatitis, for which she needed both a liver and a pancreas, had moved to Oregon from Arizona for just this reason, our reputed excellent medical care, to keep her living while she waits. But before Arizona, she'd lived in Hawaii, I believe she said under a tarp on the Big Island Beach. And she cooked, I mean seriously, in fact published a cookbook, knew all there could possibly be to know about fish. But to get to the point, she had this vacuum cleaner that she didn't need, a friend having gifted her a lighter, easier dumpster find, and did I want to have a look? She'd sell it to me cheap, and led us to her old and dusty, packed with junk, something or other ancient American Chevy car, thick with cigarette fog and cluttered with stuff, driving just around the corner, where we suddenly were surely somewhere in the Ozark mountain range, forget Santa Clara. Blackberries and shaky wooden broke down houses, surrounded by car bodies, car parts, tires, rusty clippers, chains and boxes and saws and empty green bottles on the ground and various people wearing dreads and beards and dealing with these things. She hobbled up onto one of those broken stepped, much needing paint sort of houses with rickety railings and torn screens and rusty door hinges and lugged out the cleaner which was more than just dirty. It was coated with a thick reddish filth. I said, it's awfully dirty. I don't want to bring something that dirty into my house. She said, oh, it's only dust from Arizona. You can hose it down. But won't it rust? Come on, it's plastic. <coughs> How much, I asked. And she said, 20. I looked for a long time. Will you take 15? Yes, she said, not really pleased but loaded us and it back into the car, 
and drove us back around the corner to the credit union where I went to get the cash and when I got back out, she was talking on her cell phone, husband wanting beer. She was telling him that I hadn't got back yet, but don't worry, I would, he'd get his beer. We parted ways, the dog and I with brand new filthy cleaner in the barrel. And when we got home, I hosed it down and scrubbed and cleaned and noticed that the vacuum hoses were completely blocked with soaking wet sawdust. And I used the toilet brush to get it out. And then my brand new fake feather duster, which I wormed inside the hoses and was therefore totally ruined, but so what, it worked. And I scrubbed some more and finally got the whole thing really clean and brought it in and turned it on. It burped out giant hunks of sawdust, ugly globs of God knows what, and coughed a bit. But then, wow, it was great. It drank up dirt like water. And in fact, inside it looked like water. I suppose I hadn't let the hoses dry enough, you see, and now they were completely clogged with soaking wet doggy hair and ugly globs of my house dirt, and so I had to clean the whole thing out all over again, and this time I used a hair dryer on the hoses and left it blowing into them all night, and that night I obsessively redid all my walls to make a space for them, my new holy housemates. I fixed the frames as best as I could. I pounded hole after hole into the walls, trying here and here and here. And finally, I hung them just where they were meant to be. And by now, the vacuum hoses were all dry. And it was already by then yet another day. And with my brand new powerful suction, I did the other rooms and even did the laundry room, which is also the cat room, and they weren't pleased. But all oh, my house is lovely now with Krishna and his gopis on the wall. And yet, I wake this morning to the wail of sirens going by, an ambulance that could be heading up the street that leads directly to the Santa Clara Ozarks, fresh from Arizona. And I wonder, Krishna, Radha, all their friends, sipping tea so gracefully on my living room wall, my house all clean and fresh like magic. So, a long one. This one's a long one. This one I actually have turned into a little booklet that opens this way. And if you want to buy it for a dollar, or two if you're generous, um, there's a bunch of them up there behind you. This is about a trip I took to India in um, December 2013. And it was truly one of the most magnificent things of my life. So the name of this, and see, it's one glob. This is a poem with no long line breaks, no pair, nothing. Okay. What can I tell you about India? 5 a.m., sun rising up over the sea, and me doing my sun salutes up on the roof of the Sri Aurobindo beach house, they call it. Crow birds, God knows their real name making their harsh morning racket. Look down over there, see the joggers, the bikers, where French ladies in bonnets once walked their poodles. Look down over there, it's a cow chewing garbage. Look down over there, sad yellow dogs still sound asleep in the dust. And that dark, slender woman sweeping the street in her beautiful sari. And those huge moon-white oxen still pulling that wagon just as they did 5,000 years back, the world's very first yogis. See the pretty bald baby with beads in her hand. She's given her hair to the temple, I'm told. Nothing so lovely as real Indian hair. Still some stars hanging in. Look up there at the sky, clouds hovering heavy, and that jewel of a sun rising up over the sea. And look here, it's me right here, really in India, high up on a high holy roof, praising the coming of light. Bindi takes form in my brain, luminescent, this dark inner jewel, the sun's after image. Those crow birds are really damn ugly but smart. I saw one today up in a tree pecking some sort of something out of a cup it had clutched in its claw, and the people I meet like to eat with their fingers, right hand only. I need to learn how. Toilets no more than a hole in the floor and a bucket of water. I can't figure out quite what's what. 
I need to get potty trained, thank you. Not to mention that god-awful traffic. The beeping, the roaring, I can't cross the street. So what do I love here so much then? Namaste to every single person I see and they to me. What is it that's magic here? Will maybe the music rising up out of the so early morning? Or the coffee smell sweet with thick cream? Or maybe it's the incense from all of these temples. My God, I've been blessed by an elephant. A real one, a real blessing. Not one time, but two, three, four. I don't know how many times. Every night for the last holy week and a half, I love that elephant. Her name is Lakshmi, goddess of wealth. But really, she's more like Ganesh, and this is his temple. Everyone wants me to buy this or that stuff, and I want to buy it too. I want to buy something for everybody I can think of back home. I want to buy everything, it's all so cheap. I'm a millionaire here. I could buy anything I want for anybody, even for me. I could even get my eyes fixed if I just had the time, but I don't have the space to carry it home. Don't even have a suitcase, not really, and I just can't decide what I want. There's this parrot this guy has on the side of the road, and the parrot creeps into this kind of a dollhouse, pulls out a paper, and on it is written my future that really comes true in a day or two. Anyhow, I didn't even know I was in danger, except now it makes some sort of sense. And on top of all this, I've got a new friend who says kind of in wonder, look, I've got a new friend. And it's real, but it's only real here where everything is magic. Even the sad things, like how lonely the dogs are, the needy street people, desperate yowling the motherless kitten. There's this gesture they make, these women with babies. Fingers not quite touching the mouth. Gracefully, gracefully feed me, I'm hungry. Please feed my baby. Did I tell you the farmer who loves like a child his land, every leaf, every blade of green grass? Did I show you that vast, awesome hall that they've built out of mud, baked into brick, built up into magnificent arches? The architect come for a visit, stayed for a decade. Did I tell you the tricky Norwegian, the buckets of snakes whose poison is healing, the temples once hidden down under the sea? Did I tell you the beauty of brilliant sun rising up out of the roiling deep dark? Did I tell you the huge white full moon? Did I mention that truly wise man, Vijay, so humble, who welcomes us here to his city, his ashram, his home, his birthday, our singing, the magic of silence? Or the lovely wise woman, Harvender, her teaching? Did I tell you that all of the people I meet seem to know for a fact that God is creation? Not the cliché, but the reality of it, simple as that. All of us God, even the dog and the beggar and the pretty black baby, her necklace of flowers. God Kali, God Lisa, God Krishna, God Hannah, God Yuki, God Anna, every single one of us God, even me, foolish me, one tiny God person, the crocodile, centipede, sweet, thoughtful Shreya in search of her roots? Did I tell you the temple guard Paul, whose wife, whom he loves, is dying, scoops me up for a ride on his bike and we almost tip over? Did you hear about Sharana, Satya, those strong village mothers who stand up like mountains day after day for the sake of their children? And us, who are we? Well, we're the guys, Logan and Chuck and our hero, Surendra, who crafted the gift of this journey. But mostly we're girls. Okay, women. Wide-eyed American women in India, all dressed up in our long silken saris. We're like lotuses blossoming. And the kids, all those beautiful kids at the school and the center, all the time laughing and laughing, arms and hearts open. Laughing, I say, for the pure joy of laughing and loving and living with hope. India. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to end my own reading and turn into an, um, an, an MC, <laughs> whatever it is.